Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina wa Mirana wa Mawlana wa Shafi'ina wa Habibina Muhammad. Taha Yaseen Hameen Khatim Nabiyyin Al Musir Rahmatul Alameen Rabbil Alameen Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam. Salaamun ala Jami al Anbiya'i wa Musleen wa Jami Malaikati Mukarbeen wa Ardan al Kisa' wa Ahl al Bayt al Kiram wa Ashabihi Mukhlisin wa Tabayin wa Tabayihim al Yawm al Deen. Wa awliya Allah salihin, wa ulama mutakeen, wa shuhada mutahadeen, wa jami'a mashaykhina ma rabbina masjidina ila Allah ta'ala. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati ya ma yasifoon, wa salam ala ala musaleen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa amma ba'd. Alhamdulillah, this is the third in this series of colloquia or seminar on Ibn Ata'illah. Uh, uh, we began uh, last year uh, with uh, Sheikh Rashid and Sheikh Ninui and uh, myself in uh, Charlottesville uh, on Tanwir Iskat Tadbirat and then we did uh, the Hikam this year and uh, the center in Charlottesville is, is uh, small uh, by comparison to a hall like this Alhamdulillah or Masjid I should say. The last time I was here, the boys were playing basketball, so we some kind of multi-purpose, alhamdulillah, and that's good and a blessing. But uh, we decided, uh, mainly on the behest of Sheikh uh, Ninawi, to try and bring it up here uh, into northern Virginia, this uh, colloquium, because there's so many people were interested in it. Uh, and, you know, maybe people would find that surprising. Why would they be interested in this text from, uh, you know, a thousand years ago? But uh, it's very, very relevant to the present time. And inshallah, um, though they will go into in more depth uh, into the, um, uh, into the uh, actual aphorisms themselves, um, I, in the beginning, will mainly just try to introduce this, contextualize it, and put it into a setting of uh, who Ibn Atta'illah was and where he came from and how, he, uh, how all of this came about. And also, you know, to speak somewhat about, you know, what the relevancy of it is. Basically, basically, you could say that the relevancy of it is, is that um, you know that uh, that the people who were running this world a year ago, their situation is very different than it was a year ago. Very different. And if you look at the, for instance, a, a major indicator of that would be the Dow Jones index, which is, you know, has fallen by a half in a year. And two of the talks that we, uh, the other colloquy which we gave in, in, in Charlottesville had to do with the necessity for change, uh, based upon the ayat that Allah does not change the people until they change themselves or Allah does not change the, uh, the, uh, the ni'mah that Allah, that He has placed upon them until they change themselves. Those two ayats from the Qur'an. So the people, we, we saw this, uh, alhamdulillah, we could see it coming. Because you know Allah has promised that Allah and His Prophet والسلام, will wage war, will wage war, and that's very heavy words when you think about it, will wage war upon uh, those people who uh, take part in the riba and who give it, who take it, who record it, uh, who witness it. And this whole thing, this whole, this whole Northern Virginia, if you like, it was built upon that. It's built upon uh, usury, it's built upon uh, games of chance, because the market, and so they play the market, games of chance, and all of this is going to come tumbling down. The World Trade Center was only a presaging of what is going to happen. You might think of that as the two things in the dollar sign, and the dollar sign is like that with two things like that. That's, that was the beginning of it. This whole edifice is going to be changed before everybody's eyes in the next period of time. Uh, when uh, America took the decision to, or, or uh, the coalition of the uh, Shahid, mashallah, alhamdulillah, I'm glad you came, alhamdulillah. We have a great uh, singer with us, and he will sing in between, and so he, he came a little bit late. But in any case, you know, at a certain point, 
you know, the Chinese speak about the, uh, that the ruler rules because he has a mandate from heaven. He is blessed by a mandate from heaven. And, but this mandate, if you don't behave in accordance with the rules of heaven, so as to speak, in Chinese terms, you, the mandate is lifted from you. And this country that we're living in had a mandate. That mandate has been lifted. It's no longer here. And then when you wage war and do things like this, the, the first warning was, of course, in Vietnam. I, I, I recommend you to look back on the, the statements of Martin Luther King uh, in the Riverside Cathedral about that particular episode, that sorry episode in our history. But this last thing of a waging war based upon lies, of the deaths of over 100,000 people, of the, the destruction of, of, of uh, 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 wounding of another 400,000 people, of 4 million people who are dislocated. It, it, not only is there money running out every day, it has a corrosive effect on the spiritual uh, reality of the people. So what, what, existed, what existed is not going to exist anymore. We're seeing, you're seeing it crumbling before your eyes. You're seeing the world fall apart before your eyes. What, you, what we believed in, what we thought, what we understood was real, the, the, you know, the ability to drive $20,000 cars with, you know, with gas and go here and there and get overnight delivery and this, that, and all of this is finished. It, or it's in the process of finishing. There's a new world order coming. Not, not <laughs> what they thought it was going to be. This is just the reality of what's happening. So how, as people, we deal with that, Salaamu Alaikum Mawlana, how we deal with that as, as human beings, and how we understand that, and how we can live with that, is very, that's what, what, that is what is of, uh, that is why, uh, that is why the relevancy of this text because this text teaches you if you listen to it and you read it and you're careful with understanding it how that you are going to and i am going to be able to uh, live in a world that is changing very rapidly and things that we thought that we could count on things that we thought that we took, took for granted things that we imagined that the way the world was everybody people live of course 3,000 square foot house, oh well, 4,000 square foot house, but then there's no big problem, you know. Uh, cars the size of elephants, uh, things like that, no problem. Yeah, that, this is, life is normal. Well, that's going to change radically. And, you know, if you, you can't change with it, you're going to get destroyed with it. So you have to know how to, as they say, roll with the punches, if you like, how to deal with it. This is not some text from a thousand years ago that, you know, is somehow, you know, is interesting from some kind of spiritual and esoteric thing. No, this is crucial to understand what this man is talking about. Because what he's talking about is how you can live, how, how you learn to live when everything is taken away from you. That what you thought the world was, how you imagined the world to be, is not the way the world is going to be. And those who try to keep holding on to what the world was that they used to be, are in for a terrible, difficult time. So this is a very, this is not some book that's, you know, like something, oh, you know, we're, we're here talking about nothing, we're talking about some scholarly thing or some spiritual thing, or like I said, I'm being redundant, but that's why it's crucial. And I urge you, you need to pay both to these texts. Tanwirska the Tadbirat directs you exactly to the dropping of self-direction. In other words, you say, what I want, and there's what Allah wants. And you can either go with what you want or what Allah wants. But if what you want and what Allah wants don't happen to be coincide with one another, and you keep wanting what you want, but Allah wants something else, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Because Allah is Allah. And we are people, we are, Allah is forever, and we are for, you know, 
like this. You know, as he said, Prophet Sallam, you know, this life in this world, you know, think about it, it's like you're sitting under a tree and you're waiting for the thing and tomorrow you're gone. That's it. Life, as I'm very fond of telling people, is a terminal disease. Nobody in here is getting out of here alive. Don't, don't think about it. You know, that's not going to happen. Everybody here is going to the grave sooner or later. That's the reality. It's just a question of when. It's just a question of when. Some people might live to be 101, 102, 103, but 120, 130, 140, well, you know, I mean, maybe we have, you know, some kind of thing, though, you know, artificial eyes, artificial fingers, but, you know, how long will those last? Yeah, so sooner or later, you're out of here. That's the reality of the situation. So the world is going to change anyway, so you have to get used to that. So this text, and especially the, the direction, of the, the dropping of light on the dropping of text uh, of self-direction, and that which really, you know, is the pith of that book, the, the, the essence of that book, the refined essence of that book, which are the hikam. These, if you read these very carefully, they're like a, a guidepost for uh, understanding how to live in this rapidly changing world. So I hope, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim I hope by these remarks you, you understand, you know, the, you know, the edges of what we're going to be talking about, the edges of the relevancy, and that's why, uh, of course, you know, we have put these talks on. That's why we put the talk changes, uh, the two talks on change on. Try to prepare yourself for what's happening. Try to prepare yourself for a world that is not going to be the world that all of us grew up in. I mean, the young people, I don't see too many very young people here, but the people say, this, this is finished. What it was is finished. It's just a question of time, how long it's going to take to crumble. What's going to replace it? Well, we believe Islam is going to replace it in the final analysis because that is the future of people. Islam is the future of people. Yeah. But how that happens, uh, only Allah knows how that happens. We don't know how that happens. Sitting here, we don't know how that happens. What we do know is what, that, that what is happening. We can see it. You know, the signs are all around. That's why Allah says, you know, that there's the Quran that is a, 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 a tadwini, and there's a, tr a Quran that's a taqwini. And a tadwini is that Quran that's written in, in that mushaf that we read. That's what's the, the diwan of Allah, what is written by Allah from His words through Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. And then the, the Quran taqwini is, are those things the signs that are all around us? That's why Allah says, look at the heavens, look at the earth, look at the, the horizons, and look in yourself. And the, the, all of these things are where it is. So this, all of this, this is the, the Qur'an taqwini. When you see these things, you know something's happening. You've got to know how to read the signs. Just as you have to know how to read the Qur'an, you have to know how to read the Qur'an that's written tadwini in the book. You have to know the Qur'an that's written taqwini, the, the signs that are all around us. Because if you don't know that, you'll get hurt. You, or you'll be very uh, badly surprised, you know. So you make you look look at what's going on. Look at what's going down, as the song says. Hey there, look around. Look at what's going down. Yes, that's what you have to look at. So this is the background of, from my perspective anyway. I mean, other scholars who will be here will be talking about it. But this is what I, I want you to understand why this book is important. So I'm going to go to some of my notes and, 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 and speak upon them and, uh, uh, and, and come from there. So Allah says, What could Rabbika ilan nasita? You know, and you remember your Lord if you forget. If you forget, remember your Lord. Huh? But he says it the other way around. Remember you, uh, what could Rabbika? Remember your Lord ilan nasita. If you forget. Remember your Lord if you forget. So I would tell you, a chilling story. I unfortunately told this at Bedford last week, so Bedford people, please bear with me while I tell the story, but I'm going to tell the story again. We work with refugee children. You know, a Noura Foundation, Educational Foundation, a large part of our work is with refugee children who, who've come here. Many of them are orphans, and most of them come from war-torn countries. Like from, we started out with people from Bosnia, and then Kosovo, and then Albania, and Afghanistan, Somalia, Darfur. We have all these people. Young people, all young people, in their, from six, seven years old onward. And when the Afghan contingent arrived in our town, 
we had a number of young, and when we say orphan, I say, you know, the yatim in Arabic refer to children who don't have their fathers, because their fathers were killed in the war. And they brought their mothers here because they want them for, you know, low-grade help cleaning hospital rooms and cleaning university things like that. That's all they, I mean, it's a very cynical thing, but they got them out of that situation. Okay. So this boy, slowly the children tell you their stories. So I'm sitting with this boy one day and he says, Baba, he said, I said, what happened? He said, well, uh, what happened was that these men came to our village and these men, they're all men with imas, hmm? all had beards. They all said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And as far as we know, probably they, many of them spoke Arabic. They sat on the floor, they ate with their fingers, and they prayed, they fasted, they did all of these things. Good Muslims, you'd think. And they came into this boy's village, and this boy's, they were a different sect from what these other people were. So they came into the village, and they rounded up all the men between the ages of 15 and 55, and they put them in containers, and they locked them. And then they told the women folk, women, it's like we arrest all these people. Women, if you do anything to, to free them, we'll shoot you. Some women tried to because they heard their husbands or their fathers or their brothers in there banging on the doors and there's no running out of oxygen, running out of food. They shot them. They killed them. And they kept those men in there until they died. So, you have to ask yourself, well, call a Rasulullah, man call a la ilaha illallah, dhakala jannah. Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever, enter, whoever says la ilaha illallah will enter the kingdom, will enter the, 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 the jannah, the garden. But these men all said la ilaha illallah. They all said la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. They all prayed, they all fasted, they wore imams, they had beards, they read the Quran, they read the Hadith, they spoke Arabic, they sat on the floor, they ate with their fingers, they did all those things, the, uh, so far outward sunnah, but they were murderers, murderers. Murderers, that's what they were. Common thugs. So, what is Islam? Who are Muslims? That's what you have to see. You have to, from the story, what I want you to think, what to think. Well, how could that be? You have to ask yourself, how, how is that? Okay, one story. So obviously, if you do all of those things, that's no guarantee because you could do all of those things and you wind up to be a common murderer. So that didn't work, did it? That what they went through obviously has its, let's say, quote, shortcomings. Shortcomings. Now let's look at another thing. Great religious scholar of his time, one of the greatest of the ulama then and now, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, radiallahu ta'ala an went through everything, reached the apex of his career, he was going to be named to be the head of the Nizamiya, the, 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 the dean of the, uh, the, probably the best school in his time for teaching the law, the Sharia. Before he's going to sign up and before he's going to take the post, he takes all of his books and he goes out to the well and he drops them down the well. And he says, I'm not taking this job because I don't know enough to take this job. An honest man. Unlike these other men, honest man. And he began a life, wandering life, for many years, went to Quds, went to other places like that, looking for the awliya of Allah, and sitting with them and everything like that, until, you know, he could do that. So, look at the difference here, see? So then he could do his job, but he was informed by something that these other people were not informed by. And he makes no bones about who the people that he visited were. They were the people, and they would call them, they call them in English, Sufis. Sufis. Okay. Now let's take another little story. That's who he went to see. We won't say anything more than that. But that's where, that's where he got his change from, visiting those people. Then let's go back, say, 200 years and, and, and look at the, at the response of the Muslim world 
in, uh, in relationship to cosmopolitanism, whether it's the Hijazi cosmopolitanism or Turkish cosmopolitanism or Egyptian cosmopolitanism. What I mean is, you know, many different kinds of people doing many different kinds of things, different schools of thought contending and all like that, the cosmopolitan atmosphere and also colonialism. Hmm? The response uh, uh, to, to colonialism on one side and the response to cosmopolitanism on the other side. So what happened or what we can see in this place that we're sitting in is actually a product of it. That our thinkers, when they, when they were confronted with that, said that, you know, at the end of what we have to do is we have to have our own states. We have to be able to control, as Muslims, our own destinies. We have to have states. We have to have uh, nation states in this case, right? It's never existed. A dawlat existed before, but, but uh, a watan, you know, or even watan existed before. But states, you know, states with, you know, uh, parliaments and, uh, you know, traffic lights and, you know, things like that, you know. This is, this is the solution for the Muslims. This is what we need. And so for the last 200 years, you know, this is what people have concentrated on, making these states. We have Pakistan, we have Indonesia, we have uh, Afghanistan, arguably, we have uh, Morocco, we have Turkey, we have all of these states. And they stretch all the way from Senegal, which is, uh, has a Muslim president, to Indonesia, which has a Muslim president. So wide, wide stretch of this thing and into Central Asia, and down into Africa. All of these Muslims are in charge. The president's a Muslim. The, the parliament are Muslims. The population are Muslims. Let me ask you something. Where would you make Hijra to? Where is, is there a Muslim state? I tell the people the only Muslim state is really when you're, you're in sajda and your head is on the floor. That's the Muslim state. But never mind that story. This, this is what they imagine the Muslim state. The same thing like, like England with Bismillah written on top of it, or America with Bismillah, or Germany or Bismillah, or whatever. Japan with Bismillah written on top of it. That, that's what it was going to be. And somehow this was the promised land. That if we did that and we did all these things, we had organizations and you'll have initials, you know, ISNA and ICRA and ICNA and ISRA and da 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 da, da all of these things, all of this all comes to the, 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 the religion of reaction. You know, if you remember the early uh, Qurans, uh, uh, the early uh, 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 translations of Quran were published by Sheikh Muhammad Ashraf. You, you know, you'd see them, and they had these old English characters that the surahs would begin with, and there was yees and these and lords and all that. What was that? I said, oh, we have a book too. Oh yes, we have this book, the Quran. Look at this, and then we can put those letters like that. We have a, everything that you have. We had great scholars. How many times have you gone to me? The great scholars of the Muslim world, Al Kindi. Yes, we had Al Kindi. We had we had medicine before you had medicine. Even Sina, you know, where we had Al Jabr. You know that Al Jabr. We knew all this. We knew everything. Everything we had, we had all of these things. We knew all of these things. We were great once. Once we were great. We had all that you have. So you see, this thing of West, 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 where is the West today? There is no West today, but I mean, Shanghai is the West, you know, Chinese are Westerners, they're no longer Easterners. I mean, wh where do you go East and West? I mean, that's all finished, isn't it? And this religion of reaction, this thing called Islam or Islamism, as they call it, it's finished too. Because the two of them are like two people dancing together, it's like Bush and, uh, Bush and uh, Osama, you know, they're, they're partners, dancing partners. You can't have Bush without Osama, you can't have Osama without Bush. They, they're, they're inextricably dancing together, they're Totendans, as the German call it, the death, death, the dance of death. Hmm? This is the situation. This is what we were told. This is the promised land. What, what is there? Look at that promised land that stretches all the way from Senegal to Indonesia. Where is there what we would call a Muslim leader? Where do you see that? Where do you see Islam? 
Yes, the people, alhamdulillah, you see them. But where in the government? Where, you know, all this thing that we went through this 200 years, Jamal al-Din Afghani and Abdu and uh, um, uh, that uh, journalist, uh, what was his name in, in, in Pakistan, uh, Maududi and Sayyid Qutb and all these things are going to produce this thing. And what is it? There's nothing. Nothing. And the Sufis are dogs. Why right? Sufis are dogs? They're obscurantists. They sit in the corner, they do nothing but beads. They don't count money, they count beads. And they're nothing, you know. They have no, they have no solution for the problems of the present day. We, we don't, you know, they, they you know, run them out of the masjid. If you see somebody, oh, somebody's in the masjid and he reaches into his pocket and he picks, oh, put it back quick. Don't let them see that. You'll be banned, you know. Just the situation. But where is their answer? What is their answer? Where do you find their answer? Look at all these countries. Do you find their answer anywhere? In Iran? You find an answer in Iran? You find an answer in Saudi Arabia? These are two being, you know, they they have the well, along with Iraq, they have the gold the right lay, they have the law or Allahu Akbar on their flags. Hmm? You want to make hijrah there? Corrupt? Despots from one end to the other. Just the situation. This is what we were told. Oh, these people are your salvation. But not those Sufis. They don't know anything. They can't help you. They won't, they won't be able to do anything for you. You know, to run them out. You know, and so even said, God, if, you, if that name was attached to your name, forget it. You're, you're, you're mud. I mean, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not, nobody's ever even going to listen to you. you know, nobody's ever going to hear you. And, and, you know, I mean, I've been called a dog. You know, kelp, Sufi kelp. So this is the situation. Or I'll go a little bit further, or just a little bit further, and I'll finish with hor these all horrible things, you know. Let's take another thing. It's Friday morning, alhamdulillah. It's Juma. Oh, how great. We get up, we take a shower, you know, and get nice, get all of our nice clothes, put our nice clothes on. We're going to go where? We're going to go to the masjid, we're going to pray. We're going to pray with everybody. How great, you know, we see our brothers and hug afterwards and sisters that greet each other, you know, if they even have a place for you, you know, some places they don't have any place where you don't exist really. You know, that's another story, you know, but the, but the guys, they're all going to get to do it, you know, they're going to do the hugging thing and the pop, pop, pop in the back and everything. That's great, you know, feeling good, you know, everything like that's good, you know. Yeah, but in some places, they're getting ready for the, to go to Juma and he's got an explosive vest. Explosive vest. You know what explosive vests are? They get all these things like the, with little, you know, uh, ball bearings and things like maximum damage, you know. It's, a, it's controlled by the thing in your hand. Once you let it go, boom! Yes, it goes like that, you know. That's what happens, you know. That it really, you know, but only, that's just the sound. That doesn't really do anything. This, this really does something, see. So, what happens, you know, so these guys, you know, everybody's smiling. Oh, assalamu alaikum, brother, how are you? You know, and the imam is there and he's sitting there and he's, he gets up and he gives the khutbah and everything like that. And, and these guys always, they go for the second or third row. You know, maximum damage, right? Because you know, so the imam to begin to lead the prayer and he lets his hand go. And he takes 30, 40 people with him. What Islam is this? What Islam is this? my brothers and sisters, or the Islam of the people who throw, who, who throw acid in, in the faces of girls to keep them from going to school. We remember what the Prophet said, alayhi salatu when he spoke about Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, he said, you can take 50% of your religion from this woman, this little red-haired woman he called her. You take 50% of your, how did she know 50% of the religion? Well, because he taught her. He didn't disdain to teach his wife. He taught her what he knew. He, she lived with him. She knew what he knew. That's, that's the real Islam. Educated, because if you don't have educated women, you don't have educated Who teaches the, the children? The women teach the children. You don't have educated women. What do you have? Uneducated women, uneducated children. Yeah. And then people throw acid in the faces of girls who want to go to school. What is this? So this is the world we're living in. This is the word. You don't have to take it from my lips. You take it from your newspaper, take it from your television, take it from your blogs, take it from your, 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 your internet. You take it and you see that everything I said, I've not made anything up of what I said. 
That's what we are confronted with. That and the destruction of the new world order that is falling down upon our ears, like as we talk. 4,000 jobs here, 5,000 jobs. Maybe it hasn't hit you yet. It'll hit you. It'll hit all of us sooner or later. Or when we say sunnah or later. So what we have called for and what we have called for from the beginning, these obscurantist dogs who sit in the corner who don't do anything, is that change begins by changing yourself. If you want to change the world, change yourself. And if you want to change the world, if you change yourself, if you're a man, work with your wife and change it. If you're a wife, work with your husband and change it. And pull together, the man and the woman together, because that's the basic pulling thing of the thing. And that is the Prophet and, and Aisha and the Prophet and Khadija. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the Prophet and Fatima and Ali and Hassan and Hussein. That's the motive of all of Islam is motivated by, that's the unit that motivates it all. It's a unit that motivates it all. That's where it starts from. And if that's missing, all of these things of cities and nations and this and that and causes and this math have and that math have and this is no good and they're no good and this is this and that and that, finished. It's nothing. It comes to nothing. So this is, first part is a plea, a plea to take into account these people that have been rejected. Um, by all of these organizations who were never invited by all of these organizations, who were driven out of the masjids, who were, who were, whose names were made to, to be low, whose, whose reputations were, 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 were detracted, all of these Sufi people, because they have the knowledge and they have the means to the knowledge by which you can change yourself. That is the most important thing, to know how to change yourself. This is 1400 years of people from the, from the very beginning, because this is not something that began late. This had nothing to do with what the Orientalists said about Persians and Hindus and all. That's a lot of rubbish. A lot of rubbish. Barakalofi, you see. Thank you so much. That's a lot of rubbish. This is from the beginning of Islam till now, it, it just from, excuse me, it, it just from what I've said, this is how it happened. This is how Medina happened. This is how, if you want to, 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 to look at Beit al-Arqam and what happened in Beit al-Arqam and what went on there and how it changed and how did Umar become a Muslim and how was he changed to become a Muslim? By this means of changing yourselves and changing your families and changing the thing until you make a community of changed human beings. That's what this is about. How to bring this about. And how to do this. How to change yourself. How to understand what is going on around you. How to learn to read the signs. How to do these things. Because by doing these things, you will be changed by these things. By doing what Allah says. By doing these things. And the, 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 the basic thing which you know, which is just, which is just you know, the maintenance. Okay, the five prayers and all that. But then the sustenance of the, of the, the tahajud. The sustenance of, uh, 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 of, of the, the, the kira of the Quran in, in, the, in the time of the Fajr. He says, it's, it's recognized by Allah. It's, that any time that there's a circle of people who are reading Quran. Anytime there's a circle of people who are doing this, angels come and they spread the sakina on these people. Where? What do you get sakina from talking about uh, problems in the new thing, uh, challenges and whatever, you know, colon, whatever, you know, however they write that thing, you know, like that. It, nothing. Waham. Kalam fadi. At the end of the day. He said, any, anything in which Allah's name is not mentioned, anything in which the Prophet ﷺ is not called, the Salat was salam on the, on the Prophet, it's, it's like as though you never even had something. It was for nothing that you had it. Nothing. So what, this is the context of why I say, why is this important? Because all of these things haven't worked. All of these things that they told us were going to make our life. We want, we're all Muslims together. Everybody in here, maybe we have some visitors, uh, welcome to you who are not Muslim here. But mostly, I think everybody here is Muslim. We were told, and we've been told for 200 years, that if we did this, this, and that, life would be different. And life is not. And I've shown you why it's, I've shown you the reasons, I've shown you the pictures of what has happened that proves to you that it's not. It's like you, you, the man used to say, are you better off than you were four years ago? Are you better off than you were eight years ago? No. 
No. Not. Are you better off? Are you Muslims better off than you were 200 years ago? No. Where are we better off than we were 200 years ago? Where? What, what nation? What state? What country? Where, what place? Where, where is it? Yes, yes, we, we could talk about polylocality. Polylocality. What do I mean by polylocality? I mean, there are, there are small things like the Sheikh Rashid's thing down in Bedford or some, pla some places like that, or the Tosin Bayrak thing, or maybe, 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 maybe Sheikh Umar's place down in, 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 in South Carolina. Or thing. There are places, or there are people who are lights. Who are lights. This is polylocality. Yes, in those places, but they come and they go. Did some people try to establish them? You look at, like, say, you look at the Silsila, the Nizamiya, and you see, like, father and son, father and son, and you know there's a light went like that. It doesn't work like that. Light and light upon light upon light upon light, here and there and here and there. But as a whole, no, you don't see it. You don't see it. So, this first part is a plea to you to understand these people of Tasawwuf, the Mutasawwufun, these people, and what they can give to you, to the society. What, what are their, their, their gifts to the society? What do they have to offer, really? They have everything to offer. Because they can give you the means by which you can change yourself. And that's the most important thing. Because if you don't change, you know, if people don't change themselves, what? What is there? Nothing. So, I hope, and inshallah, you say, why are we studying these books? This is why we're studying, because these books, this person, Ibn Atayla, now I want to talk a little about, inshallah, Sidna Ibn Atayla. Where did this man come from and how did he come to be, inshallah? Who was he? Bismillah. He was a Maliki uh, Faki. A Maliki Faki. And he was the son of a Maliki Faki. Who was the son of a Maliki Faki? From Al Iskandriya in Mus or Alexandria in Egypt. He was from the tribe of Judah. For those who don't remember your history, when Sayyida Hajar, the wife, the first wife, the, the wife of, of, of Sidna Ibrahim, alayhi salam, went with Sidna Ismail, alayhi salam, to Mecca, according to Allah's plan, unlike what other people will tell you, jealousy or something like that, but according to Allah's plan, when the Zemzem was discovered. In Mecca, nobody was living there from, from a long time ago, from before the, the, the time of Nuh, alayhi salam. Mecca had been like this. It was, had been, the flood came and Mecca was reduced. The, 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 the foundation, that's why they had to build, rebuild the foundation of the, of, of the Kaaba because it had been washed out in the time of, of the flood and in the time of Sidna Nuh, alayhi salam. When the Zemzem was found, found when, when they found it, when Jibril revealed to, to Sayyidah Hawa, the, the uh, radiallahu ta'ala anha, the, the, the water of Zemzem, then Mecca became a viable place to live because before that there was no water and where there's no water, people don't live. Okay? So people began, who was the first tribe who lived there? Judah. Ibn Atta'illah is from that tribe. That's his... That's his antecedents, Judah. This is the oldest tribe of Mecca, Judah. So that's who this man is. A Faki, a Maliki Faki to be precise. A father and son and like this, from a family of Fukaha. That's who he is. His father was the student of Sheikh Abu Hassan Ashali, Kadasallahu Siru. And I will get to that after I explain this. I have to explain this to get to that. His father was the student. And why his father was the student? His father, you know, the, the Fuqaha, Allah bless them all, and, and, and especially those who have taqwa, 
you know, uh, and not those who, you know, well, I won't say, but uh, especially the, the mutakin among them, they are careful. That's, that's their, the best part, they're very careful people. Because they have to be careful to look at everything, the ruahu, the isnads of things, where it comes from. They, they're careful, very careful people. So, you know, Sufis say things and they don't, you know, as Sheikh Ninawi tells us, you know, well, we call this, a, it's not really a hadith, but it's the, the hikmah of, of the Sufiya, you know, I mean, it passes for a hadith, but it's not really, I mean, he's, he can tell you what is and what isn't. That, that's a, the muhadithun, that Allah bless them, that's their, they, they can tell you what is. And the Sufis, when they talk, they say things, you know, and they say sometimes things that are, you know, well, uh, I don't know, you know, they're doubtful or like this in some way like that, but they have some other truths and so what he says there is a truth in them but it's not exactly how it's reported to be the truth or how people would like to you know think about it but it is the truth so this father of, of Ibn Atayla you know and his father was very opposed to the Sufis it's, it's very opposed to this and he, and as he was a teacher of Arabic besides and he made a lot of trouble actually for Sidi Abu Hassan and Sidi Musa Abbas who was the Khalifa of Sidi Abu Hassan and who was the teacher of Ibn Atayla'ah, and we'll get to that in just a second. Anyway, his father, I, what convinced his father? What convinced his father was he came one night, you know, and he was listening to the Shaykh talk, you know, and they, they talk, and they talk about this and that and everything, and you know, there's little bright scintillating lights in what they talk about, and so, wow, you know, the little things you, you hear and they stick with you. You know, they never leave you, because they're, that's, that's what hikmah is, these, these little bright things, little bright lights, and you say, wow, wow, what did he mean by that? Ooh, you know, he said, all of this, but that one thing, that, that was for you, incidentally. That was just for you. That wasn't for anybody else. That was directed for you. That was that thing. That, so he said, he said uh, you know, if you ask me a question, like I had a teacher, and he, uh, one of the things that convinced me about Islam, by the way, was I had a teacher, and he, he told me, he said like this, he said, ah, son, I was a young man at the time, he said, son, he said, uh, ask me any question you want. I have the answer. Do you know, like from somebody coming from America, grew up in America, somebody said, I got the answer to every question? So, wow. Somebody's got the answer to every question. And then, look at his humility. He said, and if I don't know the answer, in other words, I, maybe I don't know the answer to everything after all, I'll find it for you. Meaning that, yes, there is an answer for everything. I might not know the answer for everything, but I'll find it for you. I'll give you that answer. You see, that was very convincing for me. I said, wow, that's great. Somebody can finally answer my questions. I got all these questions. They would say, well, you know, this, or they say mystery, or they say that, or they say this. But he said, no, I have the answer to your question. So he said to the sheikh, what did he say to the sheikh? He said, the sheikh said, he said, if you ask me a question and I don't have the answer, I will find the answer for you inside this cup. Or, I will find the answer for you woven in that rug. Or, I will find the answer for you in that crack in the wall up there. You see that crack in the wall up there? I'll find the answer for you in that. He said, whoa. This convinced him. That was for him. So that, that, was his, that, that was what took, it took for him to say, yeah, these people really know so this guy knows something, you know, because, you know, this is what I was telling you about before. This is the Quran, that's taqwini, not tadwini, but taqwini. It's written, the signs are all over. If you can read them, you have the answer. He said, dude, here's the answer. I have the answer for you. It's right in that rug. You look at that rug, it's in the end. So it's up there. It's in this cup. It's like this. Also, about the cup. What's in this cup? What did you say? Water. She said water. She said what? What, what, what do you think is in this cup? Tea. Okay, she said tea. Okay. What's in this cup? Anybody else have anything? Yeah. Sustenance. Okay. If we can take a sip of it. Bismillah. What's in the cup? Water. Water. Okay. You guessed that it was water. He guessed that it was sustenance. Somebody else guessed it was tea. He sipped it. Men dhok ya'arif, ma dhok ma ya'arif. Who tastes it, knows it. Who doesn't taste it, doesn't really know it. Understand? Okay. Okay, so that's, he said, in the cup. So he had the, that's the answer. You see the answer in the cup? That's the answer in the cup. He tell you, what is it? Water. Water. How does he know it's water? He tasted it. Bismillah. 
one was surmising, one was speculation, one was something else. Who knows? So, this is, the, this is how he was convinced, his father was convinced. Now his son grew up and the old Sheikh, Sidi Abu Hassan passed away and his, his Khalifa was Sidna Mursi Abu Abbas from Spain, European. Sidna Abu Hassan al-Shadli was a Moroccan from Maghrib. Sidna Mursi Abu Abbas was a shipwrecked Spaniard who landed up in Bonn on the coast of North Africa. And Abu Hassan happened to be, quote unquote, happened to be passing by, and he looked at him, and he looked at him, and da 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 da, and this was that, and that was that, and he studied with him, and anyway, he became his Khalifa. He became his successor. And he attracted, because the father used to go to Abu Hassan, the son, you know, he would go, but he went to pick hope, because the grandfather, you know, because often the, the father, the grandfather has more relationship to the grandson than the father has to the son. I mean, if you, those of you who are, as I am, grandparents and so on and so forth, you know that this is kind of sometimes a generational gap, so as to speak. So this father, this grandfather, who was the teacher of Arabic, who made a lot of trouble for Sidi Abu Hassan and a lot of trouble for, for Sidna uh, Mursi, uh, uh, Abu Abbas Mursi, he, he, taught, he, you know, he said, you know, you be careful of those Sufis. They're those Sufis, they're dangerous people. You know, you be, be careful. When you go down there, son, you, 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 you know, because you know, you know, you know, you're going to be fooled by what's going on there. You better be sure, you know, what's happening and so on and so forth. So he, he used to go and pick holes in the sheikh's thing. He said, anytime the sheikh, you know, because sometimes the sheikh would say something and it was, either the rawahu was wrong or the isnad was wrong or this was, something was like that and he'd find fault in it. He'd say, but Mawlana, ba 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 He said, you know, da 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 and what da 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 and da 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 and do 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 and da 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 and he said, oh, sorry, sorry, but anyway, da 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 da. Ah, okay, all right. So like that, right? So he, he found a way, you know, like this, and so, but he, he kept became, become intrigued by the sheikh. He became intrigued by the sheikh. We do. We can become intrigued by these people. So one day he went there, and as the thing happens very often with the sheikh, you know, he said, uh, he thought the sheikh was sitting eating fruit. And he said uh, to himself, ah, oh, he said, uh, gee, I would, I would really like, I'd like some of that fruit. And as he thought this, the sheikh said, here. And he said, oh, he can read my mind. Wow, that's something. Then he said, Sidi, I wouldn't stop asking you to be a pharmacist. You can be a pharmacist. You can be a professor. You can be an alum. I'm not going to change. That's fine. We need all of these things. So it, two things happened, right? He knew that he knew. I had a friend who used to go visit my Jack and he said, I don't like to go to visit him because I don't like to think in his presence because he, he reads my mind and I think bad things sometimes. And, you know, I'm really embarrassed in his presence because, you know, my mind is like that. So he stopped going to the Sheikh because of, you know, what he thought in his mind because he didn't want the Sheikh to know what he was thinking, right? So that's the way they are sometimes, but that's what happened. Anyway, it's like that's what happened. So, but, but he relieved him. He said, you can be an alum. We don't have anything against the ulama or the pharmacists or the scholars or the taxi drivers or the bankers or whoever it is. All, we, all we're going to do is we're going to give you something to augment what you have. You will be a better pharmacist as a result of knowing us. You will be a better scholar as a result of knowing us. You will be a better alum as a result of knowing us. Your life will be for the better. And he was relieved by that and he stopped his questionings and he stopped going to poke questions and poke holes in the sheikh's thing and he became, to, he became one of the, the two khalifas of Sidna Mursi Abul Abbas. He and Sidna Yakut al-Arsh. Sidna Yakut al-Arsh from the Hanafi line. Hanafi, not because of Abu Hanifa, but Hanafi because the Hanafiya in Arabic is a faucet. And these are the people who are oral. This is my line, the oral line, right? These people, when you open their mouth, like that faucet, like that Yakut al-Arsh, right? But, but even Atta Allah, like my brother here, is scholar. Allah bless him. We need this scholar because Abu Hassan and, and, and Mursi Abu Abbas and Yakut al never wrote anything down. They left their adhkar, they left their dua, they left their this, but they never wrote anything down. And what did they say? They said, my students are my books. You want to read my books? 
see my students. You want to read my books? You want to read what I have to say? Look at this person here. Then you'll know what I have to say. Huh? And what he does, he does. so then, and he's going to tell you more about further on that, but, but Ibn Ata'illah became the means by which we know about the teachings of Abu Hassan and, and Mursi Abul Abbas because he was a scholar. And what can the scholars do? What is the blood of scholars? Ink. Ink is the blood of scholars. And he wrote and he wrote and he wrote these books and by these books, by these books and other books like that, we know who was the teachings of Abu Hassan and, and Sidna Mursi Abu Abbas. That's how we know. Otherwise we would not know. We would be left with Hisb al-Bahar and things like that, which were very important works, but we wouldn't know. Okay, now I'm going to wrap up now. Who was Abu, uh, Abu Hassan? Who was Abu Hassan? Abu Hassan Nashadli was, and, and now you understand uh, just from this one story how the whole thing happened. Okay. He was the student, a student of uh, uh, Sidna Abu Harazm. He was, he was, he was um, uh, from, from Al al Bayt. He was, uh, he, he, he was Hanafi, uh, he was Hassani, and he was Husseini on his mother's and father's line. He grew up in a place called Gumara, uh, which is in northern uh, 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 Maghrib. And uh, he studied first in the Qutab system, then he studied in the Madrasa system, and then he went to Karween in Fez, and he studied with Abu Harazm, who was the student of Abu Madian al Ghoth. Abu Madian al Ghoth was similar to uh, Abdul Qadir Jilani, who was al Ghoth in Baghdad, in that area in Africa, in North Africa. Sidna uh, 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 Abu Madian al Ghoth was a similar person. From him, many people came. Okay? So that's who he was. That's who he studied with. And when he studied with him, as the, when he became an undergraduate student, as equal to an undergraduate student today, he finished his studies, he, be, he became obsessed with the idea of finding the Qutb. He went to find the Qutb. You all know who the Qutb is. I mean, you know who, what the Qutb is. The spiritual pole of his time. That's what he was looking for. So when he reached the age of these young men like this, 26, 25, 27, somewhere around in that, he left there to go to find the Gauth. I mean, to find the, the Qutb. And he went and he went. And at that time, Baghdad was the center of the universe, of the Muslim universe. This was before Halugu's burning, of, uh, uh, throwing of the books in the diggers and like that. This is Baghdad was like that. It was the place to be. And he went there and he looked for the teacher and he looked and he, he, made, he went by camel, he went by foot, he went by horse, he went by boat, he went, he went, he went, he went. It took him a year and something to reach. He finally to reach there. The man he was looking for was not there. Of course he wasn't there. So they said, oh no, Yani. Uh, he, he was reputed to be Ahmed Rifai at the time, was reputed to be the Qutb at the time. He said, no, no, uh, he passed. But his uh, Abu Fatwasati between, mm, uh, between uh, Bursa, uh, what, not Bur uh, huh? Basra, yeah, Basra and Wasit, if you, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the marshes, because the Sufis used to go and hide in the marshes because they were hunted down like dogs then as they're hunted down today. They, he, he was there in the marshes like that. He went and he found him. And he said, Ya Mawlana, I found you. I can't believe. He said, son. He said, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for the Qut. Oh, the Qut. Oh, yeah, the Qut. Uh, it's, he's passed. I'm not the Qut. No, you, I'm sorry. But uh, where you want to know? The, yeah, he said, I want to know the Qut. The, the Qut, he's in this valley in Morocco. And uh, he's living on this mountain called Jebel al-Alam. You know, and it's between here and here. And it's in a, in a valley called Beni Arus. Beni Arus. This is the valley of Beni Arus. This was 15 miles from where Abu Hassan was born. Huh? 15 miles from where, Benny, from where Abu Hassan was born. So he gets back on his camel, gets back on his horse, gets back in his boat, walks on his feet, and goes back there, and he comes back, and he finds who? Ibn Mashish, who was his teacher, who was the Qutb of his time. So what this tell you? What does Allah say? Allah huwa ma'kum ayna ma kuntum. Allah is with you wherever you are. The, the teaching of Abu, Has Abu Hassan, he told the people, he says, my teaching is not like the teaching of Al-Ghazali. There's no saluk in the shadowly way. We're not going anywhere. Where is it to go? Allah is with you wherever you are. Where are you going to go? Is there somewhere, something you're looking for someplace else? If Allah is ma'akum is with you wherever you are, where are you going to go to find Allah? Someplace else? Where? Where would you go? There's nowhere to go. Where would you go? Nowhere. In yourself. 
in yourself. You will find your answer in yourself. So that's why now uh, brother will talk about inshallah about more about these these the, the, because that's what it teaches you and there's nowhere to go you don't have to travel anywhere you have to travel inside of yourself if you want to know the truth you don't you don't need to, cars and boats and you don't need all these things you don't know anything like that. just where you are you will find yourself if you find somebody who helps you to clean yourself it means to clean yourself so I thank you for listening Inshallah, I hope you this is, puts it in some kind of context. Uh, Brother Abdul Hadi Hunakam, who I've had the good pleasure of knowing now a number of years, and uh, who is uh, uh, proficient and, and powerful in Arabic and in English, and who studied these books and teaches this thing, he will talk more about this subject. Later on, we'll have Sheikh Abdul Rashid and Imam Majid, and then we will have uh, uh, Sidi uh, 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 Ninawi and uh, a, a great uh, good fortune. Ghatani today, who, who has come to visit uh, along with Sheikh Ninawi. So you will, by the end of this day, you have a very really good in understanding of what this is all about, inshallah. Read Fatiha with me, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm ad-Din. Iyaka na'abud wa iyaka nasta'in. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-adhina namta alayhim ghayri al-magdubi alayhim wa